Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Larry Jacobs. I am a faculty here at the Humphrey Institute in the University of Minnesota. And I want to welcome you to the Humphrey Institute of Public Affairs, which is the University of Minnesota's College uh, for Public Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, this is the third in a uh, series of conversations with the uh, gubernatorial candidates for the three major parties. This is a series that began about four, maybe five election cycles ago as part of an effort to encourage a, a frank, substantive conversations about pressing policy issues. Uh, it's an alternative to the raucous give and take of debates and, and, and other sorts of formats, which absolutely have the role. This is just another way to, to kind of learn about the candidates and their vision for Minnesota. We've asked each of the candidates to come in and talk about an issue of their choosing that they think is of uh, substantial and profound importance to the state and its future. Um, and each candidate, or at least the Republican and Democratic candidates, have already done that, and I know many of you have been here for that. A uh, couple housekeeping items before I introduce our, our guest today. If you've got questions, please write them down, send them in, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, as I think many of you know, we use question cards when uh, our media partner, in this case, uh, Minnesota Public Radio News, is rebroadcasting, and the reason is logistical. Uh, it's to create a kind of um, a sound that's uniform. It's just easier for listeners. Uh, we will do our best to get through as many of these as possible. Um, also, cell phones, I used to say shut them off. I'm now been corrected because we are a tweet-friendly environment, uh, which means please silence your, your uh, cell phones or IPAs or whatever else you have, um, and we appreciate that. Okay, uh, we are delighted to have uh, Tom Horner here. Um, Mr. Horner got his bachelor's degree from uh, St. Thomas. He worked as a press secretary for Dave Durenberger's first campaign and then became uh, Senator Durenberger's press secretary and chief of staff until 1985. In 1989, Mr. Horner started with John Himley, a, um, a public affairs firm known as Himley Horner. Uh, it is a uh, great pl privilege to have with us Tom Horner. Please give a warm welcome to Tom Horner. Well, thank you very much. And being in um, Senator Humphrey's namesake institution, I have to tell you one story about um, that, that interim between campaign and, and chief of staff for Dave Durenberger. As you might recall, Dave was elected in a special election, and so two days after the election, uh, he and I flew out to Washington where Dave was uh, sworn in. We walked across the street, and the very first person I met in Washington was the person with whom I celebrated my 30th wedding anniversary a couple weeks ago. Libby had been a staff person for both Muriel Humphrey and before that for Senator Hubert Humphrey. And so as we tell people, we were bipartisan way before bipartisan was cool. Um, let me talk um, just for a bit about what I think this campaign is about. And starting by saying I think this is a campaign that has been rich in detail. I think it is to the good that each of the three candidates has been willing to put forth very specific details about budgets and policy proposals. And that's all to the good. Because I think this year, perhaps more than any other recent election, Minnesotans need to have a clear vision, a clear sense of not just who they are voting for, but the vision they are endorsing. Because Minnesota is at a crossroads, and there are no free rides. We are not going to solve our problems by putting all of the cost on Minnesota's wealthy any more than we will by putting all of the burdens on the poor. This is an election that fundamentally is about leadership. It is about who has the strategies, the experience, and the temperament to engage all Minnesotans in a common understanding of our challenges and a common commitment to their solutions. If we want to, to capture the leadership that Minnesota needs, if we want to build a foundation for a new generation of prosperity, we cannot rely on the simplistic answers of only taxing the rich or punishing the poor. 
The next governor needs to say to all Minnesotans, we're in this together. We need to find common ground on a common commitment to building on the great strengths and assets of Minnesota. And no action will be more important to Minnesota's future than what we do around education. But education reform will not be effectively addressed if the only question we're asking is how much. How much should we spend? How much should we pay teachers? How much should we charge property owners? We need to start asking the much more important question of what for? And I think this is true in all policy areas. We need to change not just how we spend, but even more fundamentally, how we decide how we spend. The leadership in the next four years isn't just about math. All the candidates, me included, are being asked to put out specific budget numbers to reflect spending cuts and increases. And I'm sure each of us will provide much more detail in the coming weeks. But if we try to solve Minnesota's $6 billion budget hole only as a budget problem, only as a math problem, we will have failed the state. And yet that's exactly what the legislature, Democrats and Republicans, did this year. They took a $3 billion shortfall, cut a little here, made accounting shifts there, deferred payments elsewhere, and the numbers did add up to a balanced state budget. But they don't add up for Minnesota's future. Leadership isn't about just adding or subtracting, it is about defining. Defining a vision of opportunity for everyone and the decisions that it will take for us to get there. And all of that starts not with how much we should spend, but rather what for. What are the outcomes we need to achieve as a state to have a healthy economy and a quality of life that makes Minnesota the best state in which to live? We need to stop thinking of education funding as a math problem. How do we make the budget numbers add up? And start thinking about it as a strategic blueprint. And that only happens if we begin by defining the education outcomes we believe are essential to our future. And so let me offer two of those outcomes. First, we need more Minnesotans who have some form of post high school education. And included in this are more Minnesotans with post-secondary degrees. Right now, we're second in the nation in the percentage of adults, 25 to 34, who hold a bachelor's degree or higher. We're at about 36%. But in the new economy, it's not enough. According to a recent study at Georgetown, 70% of the jobs in Minnesota will require post-secondary education by the year 2018. And the second outcome, we need to figure out how we take all the education silos we have created and fold them into a single cradle to grave education system that makes lifelong learning a reality for everyone. And if you start with these outcomes and then work backwards, here's what you get. First of all, we need to take advantage of what will be a once in my life, lifetime opportunity. Next year, Minnesota will have a new president of the university system, a new chancellor of Minsku, and a new governor. If we don't use this occasion to have a statewide conversation on what we need from all our higher education institutions, from our higher education systems in Minnesota, we will have lost a great opportunity. We need to make sure we have the right alignment of schools, the right mission for each, and ask whether we have enough bricks and mortar or too many. Our two-year community and technical colleges need to do what they were designed to do, be the bridge between local economic assets and education. They need to act as gateways to higher education. They need to help make tuition affordable by having credits that are easily transferred to all the state's four-year schools. And our four-year schools need to act in a cohesive way perhaps with different schools emphasizing different areas of excellence, but each preparing students for success. And at the center of our higher education systems must be a world-class research university. And when you go farther back against those outcomes, 
It's obvious that we will never increase the number of degreed Minnesotans if we aren't graduating enough students from high school. Yet the high school graduation rate among some of our fastest growing populations is now 60%. That's unacceptable. But we can't wait until 12th grade or even middle school to solve this challenge. To achieve the two outcomes I suggested earlier, comprehensive reform in K-12 is essential. The current system is not financially sustainable, it is not producing the results Minnesota needs, and it is leaving too many students unprepared for the productive and rewarding lives they deserve and that all of us are counting on for the future. But it's not a math problem, and it's not a funding problem. The challenges won't be solved if our only policy debates are whether we are spending too much or too little on K-12 education. So think about this. I venture I could walk into any high school classroom in any part of the state, and what I would find looks pretty much like what, what I saw on the first day I attended high school. Maybe you'd have whiteboards instead of blackboards. There probably would be a computer or two. Maybe the students would have small tables and chairs rather than desks. But the structure, the basic approach to teaching and learning and the roles and interaction between the teacher and student would be very much the same as it was on my first day of my freshman year. And check your history here. That same fall, Hubert Humphrey was elected Vice President of the United States in 1964. What other institution have we allowed to remain so unchanged, unchallenged for so long? We need to overhaul our K-12 system of education, our approach to K-12 education. What occurs in the classroom and the interaction between students and teachers. And we need to do all we can to start at the very beginning, to make sure that children are entering kindergarten ready for success. And that is going to take an investment in early learning. We need to invest in programs that are demonstrated to work. The Minnesota Early Learning Foundation is identifying the attributes of successful programs, and their work will help guide us. But we can't stop there. We need to make sure that we continue to help kids reach the really important goal, reading at grade level by grade three. And again, there are great programs to help achieve the success. One of them is one that I worked on, Minnesota Reading Corps, a private public AmeriCorps program that leverages private contributions, federal and state dollars, and volunteer mentors to help kids achieve grade level by third grade. But education reform also needs to be built on motivated, student, uh, motivated teachers. And no teacher is more motivated than the teacher we trust for her instructional expertise, not just her content knowledge. Let teachers teach. Let them determine how to make the group of 30 students in front of them the most successful they can be. Certainly we should hold teachers accountable to statewide standards but we should trust each teacher to figure out how best to accomplish the goals with the students they are assigned. And along with letting teachers teach, we need to integrate technology into learning and most importantly, into student and teacher-led designs of curriculum. The number of students in a classroom may not be as important as the ability of teachers and motivated students to design learning programs specific for, to their needs. A student who hasn't mastered the year's content shouldn't advance only because the calendar flips to June any more than a student who knows the material should be bored for three or four months only because the calendar says it's February. This vision for the future of public education has to engage all students as full partners. You know, eight to 18 year olds are in the midst of one of the most dramatic changes in communications ever witnessed and much of it driven by the enormous increase in technology. We need to capture that. We need to leverage that. We need to understand how those students who are interacting with information in their day-to-day -day lives now have that same opportunity to interact with information they can control and design in the classrooms. 
So along with students coming to kindergarten prepared for success, teachers empowered to teach, students participating as full partners, good schools also have great principles. We need to identify the qualities that make for a good principal, then proactively reach out to find those people who possess those skills, recruit them for training, put them in a residency program, give them mentoring, and then trust them to lead our schools. And lastly, we need Education Minnesota to either join us as partners or we'll have to work around the barriers the union has established. There are too many instances of good teachers and along with them, good programs being lost to outdated seniority rules. We too often have teachers trained in one discipline teaching another. And too many students are being denied the opportunity to learn from people who bring frontline, real world experience. These reforms will require more site based control, ever learning teachers, greater investments in online learning in and out of the classroom, and yes, flexibility from the unions and less micromanagement from administrators and state bureaucrats. In return, Minnesota receives an effective way to close the achievement gap. Students who are trusted for their judgment or students who are more engaged and better prepared for all of life's opportunities. Teachers who are trusted for their judgment as well as their teaching skills. And parents and taxpayers who are getting better value for their investment. What they don't take are new laws. Instead, we need leadership and political will. And that is Minnesota's challenge in education and in many other areas of public policy. So let me end with this thought. This election is not about whether we should expand the status quo by raising taxes on a few or shrink the status quo by cutting programs for some. This election should answer the question of whether the status quo in politics, in public policy, in designing Minnesota's future is working for many Minnesotans. And it is increasingly clear to all but the most dedicated partisans that the answer is a resounding no. Eight days ago, the Minneapolis Star Tribune published an extraordinary editorial saying that the choice in this year's gubernatorial election is not an either or. The Star Tribune urged Minnesota voters to look beyond their traditional party affiliation and said this, quote, voters should also consider the opportunity the Horner candidacy offers them to take a stand against the ideological inflexibility afflicting both big political parties in recent years, in Minnesota and in the nation. Horner is inviting Minnesotans to simultaneously reject both the specter of class war warfare on one hand and anti-government dogma on the other. This election, will ask Minnesotans to cast their votes on the basis of two critical questions. What kind of Minnesota do we want to live in? And what are we willing to do for it? Thank you very much, and I look forward to the conversation. Mr. Horner, thank you very much. That was a, uh, um, a visionary uh, statement about education where we go. Uh, I want to start out with a couple just uh, kind of more descriptive questions. You didn't talk about charter schools. And I'm wondering what your views are about charter schools and how you think about charter schools moving forward. I think charter schools are part of our solution. I think charter schools, along with the, the autonomous schools, are going to be part of how we reform, how we think differently about education. But again, back to my comments, I believe that Minnesota has everything in place to design the kind of, of K-12 reform that is going to take us into the future. Now, we've had uh, in Minnesota a, a pretty remarkable history. We're, this is where charter schools were kind of pioneered. But we've also uh, run up against some challenges in terms of management, uh, fiscal probity, um, unevenness in terms of performance. You're talking about more discretion for teachers and principals and, and charter-like schools. How do you balance the expectation that 
tax dollars going into uh, school is going to require oversight with this greater degree of autonomy and discretion that, that you have in mind? Well, and in fact, I think we are already moving in that direction, and I think we have put into to place some of the safeguards. I think what we need to do at this point now is, is trust our teachers, put good principles into place, make sure that we are holding schools, all schools, um, accountable to, to statewide standards, and then allow them to, to operate, allow them to, to really focus on what is the best uh, opportunity to achieve success for the students who are in front of them. Even if it comes at the risk that we're gonna have some of the schools going off the rails, uh, folks walking out with money or just falling down on the job. Well, of course, we have to have scrutiny and safeguards, but if the alternative is just allow a continuation of, of mediocrity in a lot of schools, not every school, and I don't want to, to castigate all public schools. There certainly are some very, very fine schools, fine teachers, motivated students, great principals throughout Minnesota. But increasingly, if our focus is only on how much are we going to spend, how many tests are we going to conduct, I think we are in a glide path to, to mediocrity. It is that that we can't afford. And so are we going to have some schools that maybe aren't doing everything that we need them to do? Absolutely. Will we have some schools, though, and I think increasingly many schools, most schools, and I hope all schools eventually, um, really rise to, to a new level of excellence? I think we will, but I believe it's only when, when we get to the point of saying we're going to trust teachers to teach, we're going to put good principles in place, we're going to allow schools to be autonomous. You talked about uh, new investment in early childhood education. As you know, and you've talked uh, throughout the state about, we've obviously got a $5.8 billion uh, budget uh, know, pothole or, or kind of uh, gap. Is this the time to be moving on early childhood education? Should we wait until the uh, state is in a better financial position? I think that we cannot afford to wait, um, I, and, and not only in this area, but I think there are a number of areas. What we can't do is pretend that we can do it on the cheap or pretend that we can make the investment and then not pay for it. Uh, and, and, and so I've put in my budget new money for early childhood learning. We do have to hold it accountable to the kinds of standards that, that organizations like MELF, the, the Minnesota Early Learning Foundation, are creating and, and make sure that we're getting our money's worth. But I do believe that not only do we need to make those investments, but we need to have a governor that says, we also have to stay the course because there are those kinds of investments, early learning being one of them, where the payoff is many years down the road. We can't have the, the up and down. So absolutely, we can't afford to be a state that isn't investing in the future in early learning, in research at our two and four year schools, in, in K-12 excellence, but also in healthcare and infrastructure in a number of areas. We just have to be honest enough with the voters to say we're going to pay for them and that we all have a stake in success, that this is not going to be a budget hole that is going to be fixed if we have some uh, policy decisions that say we'll give everybody a free ride except the very few wealthy or we'll give everybody a free ride except the poor. We need to, to, to engage all Minnesotans in the, the solution and say to all Minnesotans, you have a stake in the success you need to have a role in the, the solution. You refer to your education vision as uh, involving a cradle to grave process. Now, last time we heard cradle to grave was with regard to welfare system <laughs> and a welfare state. And I'm wondering, is this really kind of a backdoor to a fairly substantial expansion in the government's role? No, I think it's a redefinition of the government's role. I think that it says we need in, in all of our silos of education to break them down and to make sure that there are seamless transfers from, from point to point. I mean, look at the reality of, of today's economy. You know, it, it's fine to say, as, as some do, that we're going to create new jobs simply by cutting taxes on business. I don't think that's the only way we're going to create jobs. I think it is part of a much broader approach 
a much more detailed solution. And certainly part of the approach is that we need to make sure that those people who are 45, 50, 55 years old have the opportunity to learn new schools, skills and, and they have um, the, the opportunity to, to move into different kinds of careers. We just can't abandon them. It is much more expensive, I believe, to, to abandon some of these people. And that's going to be the reality of our economy going forward. I mean, we all hope that sooner rather than later we emerge from this recession. But even when we do, we will still be an economy that is going to be much more dynamic, an economy that is going to require much more constant engagement between the individual and, and education. And so, as I said, I think some of it is going to come through our two-year schools, some of it is going to come through online learning, but all of it has to be seen as a seamless system. And, and I believe that we need to make that transition sooner rather than later. The federal government, through the uh, Race to the Top program, has distributed over $4 billion. 17 states had the legislature, usually on a bipartisan basis, and the teachers and the teachers' unions coming together to change their laws. Minnesota sat it out. Uh, we applied and lost in the first round. The second round, we didn't even send in an application. And thereby, we've lost hundreds of millions of dollars that could have been brought into the state. Can you point to one piece of legislation that was contentious, where you played a critical role in bringing it to passage? The, wh where I played a critical role? No, because I haven't been in the legislature. Um, but, but what I will say is, is this. I don't think that, that we lost because Minnesota sat it out. I think that we lost race to the top because there, there were too many in Minnesota who decided that this was a political contest, not an education reform contest. And so the, the opportunity for us, if there's a third round of race to the top, and, and that's still an, an open question, I believe the opportunity for us is to have the kind of, of new leadership that says, look, we need to have Republicans, Democrats, independents, we need to have education Minnesota together with administrator, with school board members, with parents and students in particular at the same table to figure out what is it that we need. And, and again, increasingly I believe that the outcomes we need for Minnesota are we need more people with some kind of post high school education, including more degreed people, and we need um, a commitment to, to lifelong learning. If those are the outcomes, if we agree that that's what Minnesota needs to be economically healthy, strong, viable, then when you back up from there, I believe it's a lot easier to overcome the, the kinds of, of political fights that, that cr what were created to advance people's agenda, not to advance education reform through Race to the Top. You mentioned during your presentation that experience is going to be critical here in bringing those people together. And obviously, you haven't served in a legislature, but can you give us an example of a piece of legislation that was contentious, where you did have major divisions, where you played you know, this kind of mediating role so that folks were saying, OK, he didn't serve in the legislature, but he has been in a civil war. He knows what it's like to see bodies falling around him, and uh, no retreat is an option. Right. Where have you actually had that experience of bringing people together? Sure, and I can uh, cite any number of, of experiences because for the last 35, 40 years, that has been both my professional career and my community service career. So if you look at a number of, of the healthcare programs, I've been involved in bringing people together around how do we re redesign the, the healthcare systems in Minnesota? How do we put more of an emphasis on quality uh, over outcomes, on, on prevention and individual response? Responsibility. I've had a direct role both through my community service and in, in some of the work I've done through my previous firm in those areas. Um, my, my previous firm was, was responsible for a lot of success in, in expanding transportation and transit systems. So just to take the transportation yeah. example, can you give us a sense of what your role was and, and what some of the different forces were and how you kind of helped to create this common ground that you've been talking about? Sure. I mean, you look at, at North Star Corridor. Um, in, in 2002, it was the stake in the ground in which Republicans had billboards that said rail is social engineering. So Republicans wouldn't touch the issue and, and Democrats wouldn't go near the issue. Um, it was not going to, to move forward. It was our firm 
firm uh, that, that brought together business and labor, brought together the, the different communities along the line, and more importantly, brought together Republican and Democratic leadership along the, the corridor to, to find the, the, the common ground solution, and through that, then engaged Governor Pawlenty. And when the, the ribbon was cut to open North, North Star uh, last November, no one had a bigger smile on his face than Governor Pawlenty. Thank you. Uh, you talked about the political obstacles to moving ahead with uh, education reforms that we are seeing all over the country, other states, uh, and that we're seeing President Bush getting involved with the standards-based reforms, and now Barack Obama. It's an area they agree, and there's a lot of continuity. Uh, but what we find in Minnesota, at least the last time we had an independent party uh, governor, Jesse Ventura, is that the usual fractiousness that you see at the legislature went up a notch because the governor basically had no friends. You had bipartisan opposition. Won't it be harder under a Governor Horner administration to bring people together if you're now fighting not only the stakeholders and the usual re resistance, but this bipartisan polarization? No, because I would remind you that in the first two years of Governor Ventura's administration, he was enormously successful. Now we can argue why the, the second two years maybe weren't as successful, and there are a lot of reasons for it, but I think the model is um, the, that, that a centrist who will be elected in 2010 comes in with, with a mandate, and particularly because of the kind of campaign that I'm going to run. I'm running a campaign that is very focused on putting specific issues in front of, of Minnesotans. They know exactly what they're going to vote for, and I'm the one candidate who has made the absolute commitment that I will not run a negative ad in my campaign. I'm not going to demonize my opponents. I'm not going to vilify them. I believe that creates the opportunity for me to come into office in January of 2011 with an electorate that knows exactly what they voted for and with political parties, Democrats and Republicans, that, that I can work with. But the other thing that, that Jesse Ventura did very, very effectively is appointed what probably is one of the best uh, cabinets Minnesota ever has had. People who were there not because a debt was owed to this interest group, this political party, this alliance, but because they were the best and the brightest. They had the relationships built. And I believe the third thing that I uniquely can do as, as governor is engage the 60, 70 percent of Minnesotans who have been pushed to the sidelines. When it's all said and done, I don't think any governor is going to be successful if that governor doesn't have the commitment to say that um, this office, the public policy we need to achieve is, is, is uh, rooted in the, the consensus that has to be forged among the, the people of Minnesota who we need to re-engage as partners in public policy. We need to bring them back to the table. Gridlock doesn't just result from Democratic legislators and Republican legislators fighting each other. It's a result of the, the kinds of conversations that occur too often in, in our civic discourse, where 20% of the population is locked in over here and 20% over there, and it has become so demonizing that the 60% is afraid to step up. My commitment all along has been, I'll be the political lightning rod. I'll engage Minnesotans. You know, I've said from the beginning that while I would never make a commitment to, to being a one-term governor, because you can't be a lame duck from day one, I have always said that I will give Democrats, Republicans the political cover. I will engage the people of Minnesota. We will create common ground among the public. And if the consequences of making tough decisions, of being the political lightning rod, are such that I'm not reelected for a second term, I'm okay with that. Thank you. You've talked about the importance of education for the economy and growing our jobs. There's a lot of distrust out there in Minnesota and other states, as we're seeing from the primaries and, and the elections going on. Can you give us a specific sense of what kind of job growth are we talking about here? Uh, what will be the payoff? What's the value added 
of the education plan you have in terms of job growth in Minnesota? Well, I think the value-added payoff is a reversal of what's happened over the last 10 years. Since 2001, Minnesota has lost uh, 100,000 jobs in, in manufacturing, technology, and a few other areas. And at the same time, we've created nearly 13,000 public sector jobs. We have to reverse that. We have to turn that around and be creating jobs in the, the, the private sector. I think that's what education does, not just K-12 education, but then the, the, the seamless connection to our two-year schools and from there to our four-year schools. I believe it's also the investment, and again, I'm the only one who's been willing to talk about this and to put new money in my budget. We need to make an investment in, in research, both basic and applied research at our two- and four-year schools, and, and make sure that Minnesota is a state that is building an economy on our core industries, but also in the new cutting-edge industries. I mean, we hear a lot, and you see some of the billboards about not losing another job to South Dakota. And absolutely, we ought to be concerned with every job that is, is leaving Minnesota. But our future is much more affected by what's happening in Hudson, Wisconsin, where we have high-tech companies, medical companies, taking our knowledge, our talent pool, and using Wisconsin tax incentives to set up jobs that really are going to be sustainable in the future in Wisconsin. So let me uh, just make sure I'm, 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 I'm understanding you uh, clearly. You're proposing to put in uh, a $120 million to early childhood, K-12, to and other education areas. Right. Are you saying that that $120 million will deliver 100,000 jobs in the next, in the Horner administration? Is it going to deliver 200,000 jobs? I and mean, what are we getting for the 120? Oh, I don't know that, that you know, I have a campaign, not, not an economic modeling department. I mean, I don't have a department of, of um, economic development. I don't have a department of revenue, so I don't want to put a specific would number consider, on it. But, would, but yes, I mean, am, am, am I firmly committed to reversing that, that trend to, to saying that um, we now have 200,000 unemployed Minnesotans and tens of thousands more who are underemployed? And, and we need to, to significantly reduce that while we accommodate growth in jobs for people we want to move to Minnesota? Absolutely. Do I think that it is feasible to say that we can get back to employment levels of, of um, the early part of this decade? Absolutely. I think for Minnesota to be a strong, healthy state, we need to have that goal and vision. So just to pick up on your point about the Department of Revenue and DEED, would you be willing to submit some of your ideas on education to their estimates so they can help you figure out the concrete payoff that I, you know? And sure. this is a, this is a tough time. I think we're all seeing the doubt in voters' eyes. They they just don't seem to be believing uh, any of the the made any of the the candidates. So would you be willing to submit your proposals to the Department of Revenue or or Deed so that they could provide that? that assistance that you seem to be interested in? Absolutely, I would. But but I, I don't believe that, that Minnesotans are, are lacking a sense of clarity of the visions of the three candidates. I think that this is a year in which Minnesotans understand that there is a very clear and distinct choice. And what we ought to be voting on is not a candidate who says, because the Department of Revenue or the Department of Economic Development says my plan is the best, I'm going to put my stake in the ground and, and not budge from it. We've seen the consequences of that. I believe what Minnesotans are, are willing to vote on is a clear sense of vision, a clear sense of leadership, a clear commitment to a goal. And we achieve that goal not by saying my way is the only way. We achieve that goal by saying I'm the only one who has a track record, who has the, the um, legitimacy of saying I can bring to the table Democrats, Republicans, and independents. I can bring to the table labor and business. I can bring to the table educators, students, and parents because I'm the only one who has done it. I'm the only one who has a 40-year professional and community service career of focusing Focusing on doing what's right for Minnesota, not arguing over who's right. You talked um, about accountability as an important part of your education vision. 
can you give us a little more specifics on the kind of steps that you would be looking for to improve accountability? Sure. I mean, I think that um, the the accountability now that uh, determines so much of education policy in Minnesota is shaped by No Child Left Behind. And I think that No Child Left Behind has served an important function. I don't think we would be having the kinds of useful conversations we've had in Minnesota over the achievement gap and other issues of disparity were it not for, for No Child Left Behind. So to that and I think it's it's been a valuable tool. But I also believe that it has imposed far too much rigidity on how teachers teach, on, on what they're able to do. And, and I do think that we are losing the opportunity for some students to learn in a way that is best suited to them. And some students, in fact, are going to be left behind specifically because of the program. And so we as a state either need to say, we will get some more flexibility from the federal government or we're going to have to make the decision whether or not we'll turn our back on, on the federal funding that comes with No Child Left Behind and, and make a, a hard decision on that. If it's in, in either case, I believe that it is up to, to Minnesota working with the teachers, with qualified principals, with students and parents. And again, you know, we always think of, of education as having a single labor force Teachers, the fact of the matter is, education doesn't succeed if we don't think of students as part of the equation as well. And so we need to bring them to the table and figure out what is the right accountability. But I believe this very firmly, and, and there is research that, that shows um, the, the truth to this, is that if we say to teachers, we're going to hold you accountable for the success of the 30 kids in front of you, a motivated teacher, as part of a school run by a good principal will figure out the best way to tell us who is the effective teacher and who is the ineffective teacher. So uh, let me just roll off a few of the accountability measures as part of the, the standard-based uh, standard reforms we're seeing all over the country and that some of the other candidates in this race have talked about. Uh, linking pay to performance measured in a variety of different ways. Looking at um, a kind of relook at tenure after five years. Would those be things that, you, that you're supportive of and that you think we need for accountability? I, I, I would be supportive of putting those issues on the table to see if, if they are more than political slogans and if they really have some impact on, on making teachers more effective. And ultimately, the goal ought to be not just effective teachers, but students better prepared for success. And so if we can show some through some, some honest means that those measures are effective, then absolutely we ought to put them on the table. I mean, it is striking when you look around the country and you've got these 17 states that have gotten the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for race to the top. Many of them have these kind of you know performance uh, uh, tied to uh, payment, uh, but you're not willing to, at this point to sign on to that. No, because look, in Minnesota, w we have a program that that allegedly pays for performance, QComp. But w what did the legislative auditor find when, when that office took a look at it is that more than nine out of 10 teachers, and, and I think it was like 97, 98% of teachers participating in QComp were rewarded for their performance. Now, maybe that's the case. Maybe we are a state in which 97, 98% of teachers are performing at levels of excellence, or maybe we have a program that has become just a backdoor funding mechanism and not a real measure of, of teacher effectiveness. I believe it is teachers themselves who would be the first to say, we need to figure out who are the effective teachers, particularly if it is the teachers and principals that then we're going to hold accountable for the schools. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Emmer uh, last week said that he really thought that tenure needed to be re-examined after five years, that there's no, nothing worse, paraphrasing, but nothing worse than a bad teacher in a classroom. And if we've got a bad teacher, you've got to just go through the, uh, uh, not have uh, tenure protecting them. Do you agree with that? Well, first of all, I'd say if you have a bad teacher, why should we have to wait for five years? So I don't know that, that any arbitrary limit is the right limit. I think that, that we need to be open to a variety of ways. And look at, I was speaking to the, the superintendent of Anoka Hennepin, um, the largest school district in, in the state. He had a program at one of his high schools, a vocal music program, that was a career path for students who wanted a, a, a future in music. You know, think of it as the, the glee of this, this high school. 
and, and a terrific program. Students loved it, parents loved it, and it was tied to a young, innovative teacher. He was going to lose that teacher. He went to Education Minnesota and said, allow me to exempt 1% of teaching slots so I can save programs like this. Now this is a district with 2,800 teachers. He's asking for waivers for 28 teaching slots. Education Minnesota said no. You know, I think we need more flexibility there. So maybe, maybe we do look at, at capping tenure, maybe we look at giving superintendents or principals, and, and maybe it's better to do it at the principal level, some waiver. You know, I, I, again, I don't think we can do it by political slogan. I think we need to do it on the basis of what actually is going to work. And in the end, maybe we need a whole new structure. Thank you. What is the best class size in your view? You, you kind of suggested it's really how we do the teaching, um, but do you think class size is irrelevant? I mean, how do you think about class size, which is obviously tied to funding? Right. So it, it's not an irrelevant question. I think we have to, to look at class size completely different. Again, I think we too often set arbitrary standards. So. I don't know what the, the, the right class size is. You know, for the, the last 20 plus years, I've been an adjunct professor at the University of St. Thomas. You know, I have some classes of, of 15, some classes of 25. I understand the difference, and I'm teaching students who, who are motivated, who want to be there, who are in a master's program. So I get it, I understand how difficult it is, but maybe it's not just the number of students that, that sets that, that threshold. Maybe we ought to look at how are we engaging technology so that again, you know, that student who by February has mastered the year's coursework, why do we make that student sit there for, for three months bored out of his mind? And at the same time, the student who in February is still trying to catch up with October's lesson, why do we make her try to, to catch up knowing that she never will? Maybe there are uses, not maybe, there are ways in which technology could be applied so that you take the group of students that, that is ahead of the class and you allow them with guidance from a teacher to create their own learning process, their own learning programs. And similarly with those students who, who are still trying to catch up from October, you allow them the opportunity to interact. I mean, go to any eight-year-old and ask them how do they design the music that they listen to. You know? In 1964, when I entered high school, I bought the Meet the Beatles album, and Capitol Records told me exactly how I was going to listen to the Beatles and in what order I was going to listen to the Beatles. No eight-year-old would put up with that today in anything, you know? They'd put up with the Beatles, but they wouldn't put up with, with that kind of, of dictatorial sense of here's the music, here's the order. They create their own music in every way in which they interact with the information, they control the information. Why don't we figure out how to engage them in that same role in the classroom? And if we do it well, maybe it's fewer students, maybe it's more students. Got a bunch of questions here. I'm gonna right. try to clip your answers uh, so we can move through them. So no more Beatle anecdotes. <laughs> uh, those I went to the first concert in 1965. <laughs> no show of hands on that one. <laughs> Is it possible that Minnesota has too many school districts? Yes, it is possible. But I, again, I think the, the measure is not whether we have too many or too few. It's what outcomes do we need to achieve and then figure out what's the best way to achieve those outcomes. Deloitte um, did a study looking at the non-instructional budget and it found about a third of our uh, K-12 funding is going into non-instructional things. Do you think that we ought to be taking a very hard look at uh, substantially reducing expenditures in the non-instructional side by requiring school districts uh, and schools to uh, basically adopt a whole series of, of changes in that area? Well, I think we absolutely need to look at the administrative costs of, of school districts in every area. Um, and, and rather than the top down saying thou shalt, I think we need to figure out with school districts what's going to work best for them. I mean, in, look at in Pelican Rapids, um, a great community of about 2,300 people. Every school day morning, four buses converge on one corner to take students out of Pelican Rapids, even though there's a great school right there. You know, at what point do we start to say that's not not productive. That open enrollment for Pelican Rapids maybe isn't working 
for the student's best interest. And so I think we need to look at all of those areas, absolutely. I take it from what you've said that you think it's a good idea to have as one of our options getting back to smaller neighborhood schools. I, yes, I, I, I do think that there is value in that. And so when you do that, um, it, there are all sorts of costs that are associated with it. Some of them, just what we're talking about right. in terms of transportation and other sorts of things. In fact, those were the costs that led to these larger schools you know, in the first place. So how would you balance what you're talking about is kind of low-hanging efficiency fruit uh, versus your kind of objective of these more local, you know, teacher, uh, principal, and student-based schools? Because I think it's a matter of where you put the money. Are you going to put the money into the classroom, into education, or are you going to put the money into administration and, and oversight? Um, and so, yes, I mean, there, there are costs to transportation, but again, if you have schools that, that are closer to students, that, that are um, neighborhood schools, you know, maybe we need to say to uh, to students that it's okay to have to walk six blocks, eight blocks, ten blocks. Maybe that's a good health care program as well. <laughs> You've talked about setting up a Minnesota Innovation Fund of $145 million. How in particular would you use that money? Well, I think that's the beauty of these innovation funds, and what I've suggested is that we ought to look at three areas, academic success, healthy outcomes, and community vitality, and then be open to the kinds of ideas that are going to come from Minnesotans and, and use Minnesota as a, a civic venture capital fund. We ought to be a state that is investing in new ideas and innovation. So most of the, well, um, the, the University of Minnesota has seen very substantial cuts in its absolute levels of funding. Do you see that as just the reality that the university will face in the first year or two of the uh, uh, Horner administration? No, I would hope that we could hold the university at least, and, and Minsky schools, at least at the, the level we're at now. They have taken a, a deep hit, I think very frankly, that um, some of the cuts forced the the university and, and Minsky to do some thoughtful appraisal of, of where they were spending money and how they could get more value. I do think that we're reaching the point, though, where more cuts are going to hurt the, the quality, they're going to hurt the ability of of the university, for example, to be a world-class research university, and we can't afford not to have the university continue on that path. So I, I, I would hope that we could um, hold, hold it harmless. But I also think that we have to be smart about what we're doing and figure out, again, the conversation that I suggested where, with a new president coming in, a new chancellor of the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, and a new governor, we do need to put everything on the table and figure out, do we have too many bricks and mortar, too many campuses, or too few campuses? How do we make sure we're getting best value out of our two-year schools? Those kinds of, and, and you know, do we have the right alignment of systems? Is it time again to go back and say, maybe we ought to look at a different kind of, of higher education system? Could you point to a specific area where you think you could work with the University of Minnesota, the kind of heart of the research of, of in the state from the university system point of view. Could you point to one area where you think there is enormous opportunity for uh, university, uh, governor, uh, private sector collaboration and job growth? Sure, absolutely, and I think there are a number of, of systems. Um, so the obvious one is is biomedical, and you know, 2008, the bonding bill, a state funding, um, significantly advanced the biomedical diversity campus. You look right next door to that, uh, public investment is a, a campus of private investment occurring. I mean, companies that are going to commercialize the research and, and bring it to market with Minnesota businesses creating Minnesota jobs. So that's the obvious, but let me give you a less obvious. Um, there's a company in, in the Twin Cities called Recon Robotics. It uses technology that came out of the School of Engineering at the University of Minnesota. Miniature robotic technology that um, allows uh, police and, and military to take this robot on wheels, toss it up to 100 feet into an unsecured area, and do reconnaissance without putting lives at risk. 
terrific technology. It is manufactured in, in Winona. It is run by a company headquartered in the, the Twin Cities. But more importantly, this company now is starting to lead the drive to create an industry trade group in Minnesota around mini robotics, a whole new industry that will keep Minnesota ahead of the curve, creating this cutting edge kind of, of technology and allowing these kinds of products to be not only sold in, uh, from Minnesota companies, but manufactured here. Are you seeing things in Wisconsin or other states where they're doing that and we haven't done it? Yes, I think that one of the great programs we ought to look at is the program in Ohio, um, where they have a very aggressive and active partnership that, that um, provides both grants from the, the public sector, but also relies on the private sector to step up with research coming out of Ohio State University uh, to, to commercialize products with the incentives for those companies to locate in Ohio and, and grow in Ohio. I think that's just one example of many that Minnesota ought to look at. I, mean, I don't believe that we can just say that if we just cut government to the bone, everything will be good. That's not the economy as it exists today. But I also don't agree that if we just make government a lot bigger, everything will be fine and dandy. We need that public-private partnership held accountable to standards. Ernie Carlson, uh, who of course endorsed you. Not of course, it was a great uh, asset to have him endorse me. <laughs> of course, in the sense I think uh, it was widely reported, uh, which I'm sure enjoyed uh, you to no end. But uh, Governor Carlson was a very public champion of the University of Minnesota. Will a Governor Horner be a public champion in the University of Minnesota? Of the University of Minnesota and of our great Minsky schools. I mean, I think that we need a strong two and four year system. And what I will champion specific to the University of Minnesota is I believe we need to stay on the path of creating on this Twin Cities campus a world class research university at, um, that, that um, leads the way to a new economy for Minnesota. And that is going to take an investment in graduate programs and in research. So, uh, next question is about the Minsku system. What yeah. do you see in particular as the unique strength in Minsku, and what do they need to do what they haven't been doing? Yeah. You know, one of the things, and, and there are many things they've done well, but one of the things that I believe Minsku has done very, very well is I think they, they've created a system in which the two-year schools increasingly, now there's still more work to do, but increasingly are, are integrated into leveraging the local economic assets of the communities they serve and tied to the high schools. So with the technical colleges, I think we're seeing more and more of those schools um, working closely with local businesses to figure out what are the innovations, what is the new learning that, that needs to be developed, and what are the skills that they need to provide for those local businesses or the potential for local businesses to succeed, whether it's wind energy, packaging from Alexandria, I mean, some of those areas that are going to help uh, Minnesota grow. And on the community colleges, the two-year community colleges, I think Minsk has done a pretty good job of integrating those programs programs back to the high schools and up to the four-year schools. And so one of the ways to deal with the affordability issue is to, to help elevate the stature of the two-year schools, help those 18-year-olds who maybe aren't quite sure where they want to, to go, what they want to do, or even quite sure what college is all about, go into a recognized, reputable two-year community college, get their generals done, and then transfer seamlessly to a four-year school. I think there are a number of those things that, that our, our men's schools have done very, very well. Let me ask you a, uh, a final couple questions that are broader. If you were to find yourself 15 to 20 points behind towards the end of the campaign, would you consider suspending your campaign? Only if the other candidates would make the same commitment when they find me ahead by 15 to 20 points. Okay, we'll check in with them on that. <laughs> Let me ask you a, a, a also a broad question about third parties and the, the usual song and dance about third parties. Uh, is it's very difficult in the United States to do that. Yet in Minnesota, we had you know Governor Ventura. We've had third-party candidates, uh, you know, making a run of it. How would you size up the opportunity for third parties in Minnesota? And what do you think uh, would be sensible steps for the next uh, third-party candidate? 
Well, I, I, I think there really are two questions. The broader and more difficult question is what is the opportunity for a third party? Um, and I think a lot of that depends on what happens November 2nd. I think if I win, that, that opens up some new doors to, to a third party, um, in part because the Independence Party will have a governor who is committed to engaging Minnesotans around a centrist common sense platform. The, the more immediate question is what are my prospects as an Independence Party candidate? I don't think that's an issue as much about the, the future of third parties as it is the, the uh, circumstances that we find ourselves in in 2010. I mean, we have in the, the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate um, two candidates who are, are having a difficult time consolidating their core votes. I mean, much less being competitive among the small I independent voters. They each have one third of their, their base that is saying, I don't think we can vote for this guy. For me, actually, the electoral path is much clearer. I mean, the 30% the of the Republicans that, that I've already won, there's at least 25, 30% of disaffected Democrats that I will win. That pushes the election down to small I independent independence, I'll win that. For me, the challenge always has been fundraising, and the good news is that in the last couple of weeks, the fundraising is going very, very well. So, it's reflected in the polls, it's reflected in the, the enthusiasm, and the overall momentum. So uh, the message from uh, Tom Horner is two thumbs up for third parties in Minnesota. You feel like you're getting a fair shake. Absolutely. I think the, the media have been very fair in covering me, and I think Minnesotans have been very fair in uh, looking at my candidacy and what I specifically offer as a leader for Minnesota. Tom Horner, thank you very much for a stimulating and lively conversation. Thank, thank you. you I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you.